everyone, and welcome to Another Bite, where we rewatch the most innovative and intriguing pitches from Shark Tank. I'm Jory, and I'm joined by the agreeable, the adventurous, and the affable Ariel. Hey, Jory. Hey. <laughs> Why did the basketball go to therapy? It had too many rebounds. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, today's product promises to be nothing but net with this innovative approach to shooting free throws. Will the Sharks think it's a slam dunk or will this product be fouled out? Time will tell. Now for an ad. Help desk software, email tools, pipeline tracking. You don't need more tools to get more out of your business. You just need HubSpot. Their all-in-one customer platform is a dream come true for your teams. Generate more leads for marketing, help sales close more deals, and scale service fast. Get more for your business without working more with HubSpot's customer platform. Visit HubSpot.com to grow better today. Today in the tank, we have K3 Shooting Band. And K3 Shooting Band is brought to us by founder Nikki, who's asking for $100,000 for 20% of her business, which is a $500,000 valuation. Now, K3 Shooting Band is really designed to solve the problem that it's really hard to build that muscle memory to shoot free throws correctly. So this is a band that hooks around your pointer and middle finger and then adjusts on your wrist. And it's fully patented to help improve your free throw form. So really targeted towards those basketball players. So Ariel, thinking about our product, our pitch, and our founder, what were your initial thoughts of K3 Shooting Band? What a cool tool. And I feel mm -hmm. like Mark is like the perfect shark for this. You know, I didn't grow up playing a lot of sports. So the fact that there is something that can help like finesse a little bit more of your art and the form behind having the perfect free throw, I think is really amazing and incredible. But I think knowing that I'm not necessarily an athlete, mm -hmm. I don't really know how useful this is. Joy, did you play sports? Is this <laughs> something that you would try if you were learning how to shoot baskets? Shoot the sports balls? <laughs> yeah. So I played basketball when I was like super young, but by no okay. means a basketball player. But I feel like my first thought was, I feel like I've seen this before. Hmm. And I guess that was my initial concern because both the founder and the Sharks mentioned this is a product that's already been in like Dick Sporting Goods, Walmart, etc. So it's been in these big box retailers. And I feel like it's just going to have a lot of competitors. I know that the founder said that this is fully patented, but I wonder how defensible this is and like what sets this one apart. I know it's got this rubber band resistance that's supposed to like hook your fingers right in shape, but I was initially concerned because I was like, I feel like I've seen this in a dozen other iterations and I'm not sure how this founder is going to continue to differentiate herself, especially if she's going to be on the shelf in all of these sporting goods stores. Yeah, that's such a fair point. Because I feel like, is this really a necessary product? Do we view this as like a vitamin or a painkiller? I think they're trying to position it as a painkiller when really it's just a vitamin in some ways. And don't get me wrong, like the basketball market is huge. I was also trying to understand because of the range of demographics that could be interested in this, like how she could effectively market it and mm -hmm. try not to go so broad. Because I feel like that's actually been her problem, right? Is that she's been trying to focus on almost anyone that wants to get really good at shooting and playing basketball. And I feel like the issue is focus, not on the mm -hmm. founder's part to bring this as like into fruition as a company, but focus on specific personas to nail her marketing. Because I was like, how would you even market this, Ariel? Is it for your kids that are up and rising stars? Is it for your existing professional athletes? Maybe I'm wrong and you don't actually have to market those differently, but there just seemed to be a way where she could tighten up that messaging depending on who she's trying to sell for. Yeah, that's such a good point. And like having that focus in this instance actually allows her to have the opportunity to really reach an audience versus now where it's just like, hey, this is a very generic kind of tool that you wear on your wrist versus if you have that focus specifically on your target audience, it helps you build things around your marketing. So it's not so much guesswork. And I think that's a struggle, right? Is like we're thinking, how do we market something that's so broad that has so many use cases versus to your point, if she's thinking more about, hey, this is for kids, I'm going to push really hard on like the kids angle and formulate different value props if it's for kids versus like adults versus very serious athletes. Mm -hmm. So this is a really great example of where focus isn't necessarily like limiting yourself from a niche perspective, but it's necessary 
for you to actually like thrive and survive because she's been in the market now with this product, we find out, I think for like a few years, right? I think like 10 years. Yeah. Jeez, yeah. It's such a long time to be uh, right. <laughs> really trying to push a product and not have, you know, as many sales and like you're taking this very broad strokes kind of approach with your marketing. So I think that's a really good recommendation of like, identify who your target is, build out what those persona profiles are and figure out ways that you can like really speak to them and highlight the benefit of your product in a way that's very like applicable and palpable for that audience. Yeah. And the thing is too, is like this product, it's priced at $19.99, right? So I would rate that as like really accessible for Mm -hmm. like a lot of potential people. Her margins are amazing. She says it costs 91 cents to make. Like that's, I think (laughs) one of the largest like margins that we've seen on Shark Tank so far. So it's Mm. really about like, okay, how do you sell just a bunch of these, right? Last year's sales, she's at 43,000. I really think she just needs to drill down on like who she wants to sell a bunch of these to and then focus there. I mean, 40,000 in sales for being in a business for, you know, 10 years long. You know, I think she said also she was trying to get on Shark Tank for the last like 10 or 15 years as well. Definitely. Kind of raises the question, you know, like we always talk so much about the entrepreneurial spirit and the drive Mm, and keep pushing yourself. Yeah. And that's a part of like, (laughs) kind of like the sexiness and the allure of being a founder in like these startup kind of environments. But at what point, you know, I wonder, is it the point of, hey, I know I've been trying to push this product for nearly a decade, haven't really done as much innovation in terms of like marketing and the way that I'm positioning this. I see a lot of competition in market. At what point do you kind of decide as a founder, like, okay, I'm going to scrap this and work on my next idea that I have in my notebook? Yeah. And you know, the thing is, is like, I feel like it's totally okay to have a passion project, but Mm -hmm. this feels like something that this founder has gone all in on, which is amazing. We love to see the grind, the hustle. Clearly people are buying this. It's resonating already with someone, Mm -hmm. but this feels like a product that might have been better as a side hustle versus a main company, because also it's a one product company. And we've talked about that before where Mm -hmm. it can be really dangerous, especially if it's not like necessarily applicable to all basketball players, for example, to just limit yourself. So I'm actually kind of surprised that like, if she was like, nope, we're going to make this the best shooting for company in the world that in those years she hasn't done like product expansion. She's got a good story that would resonate, I feel like, with a lot of basketball players. But I'm not sure walking away from this pitch, I know who K3 Shooting Band is as a brand so much as a product. And I think that's also something where it's like, is it a side hustle or is it your main hustle? And I think there's some factors that need to be in place in terms of like strong brand story, potential growth and scale opportunities that just might not be as strong here, or it may have just been not as clearly communicated in the pitch. Such a good point. I mean, she's kind of gotten herself in this very unique position where, you know, you're right. She can't really expand a product like this. It's this plastic band that kind of goes around your fingers. There's only so many opportunities. Yeah. So it does seem like she's trying so hard to make it work mainstream at one point. I just feel like you kind of have to make that call because like we've seen like Blinger in the past that we reviewed. The difference between, I think, that story of where you have a founder who has spent like a decade on a product is like she had a proven kind of track record of success, right? Like if I were to start a business and to get $40,000 in sales within the year of recording an episode is like a big accomplishment to me. Win's a win. Yeah, I don't want to minimize Mm -hmm. that at all. But I think, you know, looking at like similar kind of stories that we see of founders that are really kind of pushing, they at least see some proven track record of success when it comes to either revenue, demand, or diversification. And I think to your point, Jory, like she just doesn't really have that right now. And she's really limited in the product that she has, which is a tricky spot to kind of shake out of. Definitely. And that's also something that I feel like we teased out of the founder of like Hire Me Santa, because Mm -hmm. like he had a really good point in terms of he's an entrepreneur. He's been doing this for years. But as you mentioned, there's like a point where he's like, okay, I got to sell this business. Right. So how do you also have that professional distance enough from your product to let it go when the market says let it go? And I feel like that's something that this founder needs to tease out to your point of like, is it been going on too long? When should this just be my main hustle? Or when am I going to drill into this company, not this product, but this company Mm -hmm. to make it work in the long term in the basketball space? Yeah, You know, we started to get the sharks sort of recommendations of like how to make this work. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't know if I would take (laughs) 
their advice if I was her. Maybe that's just me, Jory, in Jory's office. But we get this recommendation from Michael that it should be an influencer product. He's like, you want to sell a bunch, kid? Go to the influencers, go to the shooting coaches. I was really curious because you are like the influencer marketing maven. Thank you, Jory. (laughs) What was your thought on that type of approach for this type of product, especially knowing where the company is? I just, I feel like with the rise of video platforms and like TikTok and everything, everyone jumps on the notion of like influencers will solve my problems. Having a micro influencer really authentically talk about my product and share it with their followers is going to be enticing enough, Mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily the case. I think in this instance, it's not a very visually compelling product. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily something if you're scrolling through your feed. This is really going to stop your eye and be like, wow, that's Mm -hmm. like really cool. Or like we used to have handshakes when we were kids on the playground. Maybe it's like a new thing uh, for sports kids. (laughs) Who knows this gen alpha these days? (laughs) You know, but I agree with you that I don't think influencers will necessarily solve this. If I were Nikki and I was deciding to still kind of push this product, I would take a really broad step back and understand like to your point, what is the K3 brand and crafting that story a little bit more. And Mm. she didn't really lean into any data or like proof of concept points. And I think for a product like this, she could actually really easily gather what those points are, whether it's, hey, out of 10 shots that were made on average, you know, 70% of them were improved versus not having this device. Like, I think there's really easy ways that she can kind of gather that. She could really lean into, you know, her current customers to like really understand like what is the benefit of buying into not just this like K3 shooting band, but within the K3 brand itself. Yeah, We make better athletes. We make stronger athletes. Maybe that's like the, the tagline or, you know, the little like slogan that comes afterwards. But I think if she really spends time focusing on crafting that narrative, narrative, defining what her reasons to believe are in the product and back it up with some data, I think that's going to go much further in her efforts beyond just focusing on Instagram influencers or social media influencers because you really need a visually compelling product that's going to hook folks within the first three seconds or else you lose their attention. And I just don't think the shooting brand has enough cachet to do that. Definitely. And I love that emphasis on visuals because I feel like understanding her visual identity as it applies to her brand story could be really like a strong way to pull people in more organically. To go back to our point about competitors, that's actually why we see some of these sharks start to go out, right? Because it's like Mark, who I was like, this is the dream shark, right? He mentions that he's already in that competitive space, right? So he unfortunately had to go out. Kevin mentioned that he would only see this working if it was direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. He didn't really see her retail play, so he went out. And then Barbara mentioned that it wasn't her kind of thing. I'm out. I can't see the Barbara stamp on a basketball uh, (laughs) shooter. (laughs) So true. But, you know, Michael, who's the guest director from Fanatics, says that he doesn't like the business so much, but he really likes this entrepreneur. So that's Mm -hmm. when we finally see that, thankfully, that sharks step into the ring. Lori mentioned that she too was a big fan of founder Nikki, so offered to partner with Michael. So they offered together $100,000 for 40%. And it was a Shark Tank deal. Big steak. But I also feel like (laughs) at the stage that the company is in, I think that that actually like that joint like leverage from the sharks is going to potentially drive this into a more successful business. So I know that sometimes we're like, oh, like don't give away your company, know your worth. Mm -hmm. But I feel like in this case, for how much these sharks can turn this brand around in terms of marketing, in terms of distribution, it actually made a lot of sense to me. I agree. It's not the first time that we've seen sharks kind of invest in the founder itself. So I hope that Mm -hmm. maybe in the future, you know, maybe it's not the K3 shooting band itself, but maybe there's more like innovation that comes out of Nikki because she seems very passionate about like sports and her history. So I was glad to see that the sharks, you know, at least recognized the effort of trying to get on the show for like 15 years tirelessly. Yeah. Like I can't even like, commit to a metal. sweater for 15 years, you know? Like <laughs> this is not like you fill out an application. This right. is a pretty intensive process yeah. depending on how far she got. So it shows that she's determined. And I feel like that kind of drive in founders is what makes them successful, mm-hmm. even if the product could use like a little bit of tweaking. But you know, marketing, we can work on that. Yeah. 
you hire an agency for that or us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just listen to this podcast. That's what it is. Production for today's episode was brought to you by Ari Desarmo. Editing comes from Robert Hartwig and support from Alfred Schultz. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you subscribe to the greatest podcasts ever. That does it for me. See you next week in the tank for another bite. The Product Boss hosted by Jacqueline Snyder and Mina kunlo Sitep, is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Take your physical product sales and strategy to the next level to create your dream life as they deliver a workshop style strategy hour of social media and marketing strategies so you can up level as the boss of your business. Another Byte listener should check out the most recent episode, the seven things I did to generate over 10 million in revenue. This episode dives into the seven key pillars that every product based business owner needs in order to scale their business to the million dollar mark and beyond. Plus, they tackled that overwhelming feeling that everything needs attention and how to prioritize tasks effectively. Listen to The Product Boss wherever you get your podcasts.